Well, hello again, everybody. Well, today I thought we'd have a go at uh, just trying to get this thing nailed together. So what we've got left to build? Well, we've got the uh, the RAM board to build. We've got the ROM, the serial I/O, um, and actually the main uh, the main CPU, uh, which is that board there. So. Um, there's not very much on uh, those three boards, so I think what we'll, what we'll do is we'll just get them uh, three boards bashed out. So we'll do the RAM, the ROM, and the, uh, the CPU chip. Well, you know, I think it might be interesting before we install the uh, the ROM chip. It's this. Uh, it's a 27 C512 ROM, 28-pin uh, DIP package. I think it might be quite interesting to actually. Um, um, install that ROM chip into my uh, programmer and s just see if we can read it and have a look at the contents. Again, see if there's any e Easter eggs in there, see what it says. I can also just take uh, a copy of the uh, the ROM contents. So if I do something silly, like blow it up, which let's face it, is quite likely um, uh, I'll have a backup copy to reprogram it with. So maybe we'll do that again today. Um, I think I've been waffling on a lot in the last few episodes and uh, I kind of know that most of you people don't watch my videos for its technical content. You just put it on in the background as a little bit of company and uh, while you're doing something more interesting in the workshop. And I've got to admit, that's absolutely fine with me. Uh, I don't like to think too hard. You know, I come into the workshop after a day at work and uh, yeah, sometimes it's just really nice to uh, switch the brain off, plug the soldier iron in chill out watch a bit of youtube so yeah that's what we're going to do well the ram for this um is a it's a 32k static ram and then we've also got a couple of other bits of uh glue logic on here we've got a 74 lso4 which um i think is a, just a not gate and what's the other i see we've got a 74 ls32 which uh i think is something like a quad nan gate and uh what those are designed to do is they're designed to um, decode uh, the signals coming from the Z80 so that they enable the chip at the right time. Uh, there's a few there's a few uh, pins that are involved with reading and writing to memory. I think there's something like a memory request and then there's a read and a write line. And uh, yeah, a few other bits and bobs. So basically, uh, these two ICs here effectively combine, they glue all those... Uh, various, well they don't glue them, they, 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 they and the requirements of the Z80 together, they and them and then provide like an enable line going into this IC so it knows whether, whether it's, it's going to be reading or writing data. Um, because th this particular ch I chip architecture if you like, uh, you've, got, um, you've got an address bus and you've got a data bus, so you've got two separate buses, but those address buses are shared uh, across multi peripherals, so they use these chip select lines effectively to uh, enable ICs. So again, I think we saw that before when we looked at this board here. You can see on the, uh, we can see these are the address lines from uh, A0 up to A15, and then we've got the data lines here D0 to D7. And uh, but if you look at the wiring, it goes all the way across. It goes to every, it goes to every. Um, you know every board that's going to slot into here and of course you, you can't have all the boards talking at the same time oh sorry all the devices you can't have them all uh, talking to the z80 at the same time so they use uh, this combinational logic here to kind of decode the various signals coming from the z80 and um, you know telling them the ram to either write or read or, or to actually just shut up and do nothing because the information on the data bus isn't for the ram chip it's for something else so yeah and okay that's my crap explanation um i should win a prize shouldn't i for my inelegant and crap explanations of it because i am rubbish of explaining stuff and uh yeah there's a reason for that and it's because I'm, I'm winging it you know I'm, I'm only regurgitating what i've read i don't really know what's going on but you know the more you actually play with these things and you uh you know, you read you read the instructions that come with it. Um, I've downloaded the uh, the Z80 manual. Oh, and I just point out that I have actually um, included in the show notes the uh, the downloads for the Z80 manual 
and, the, uh, and apart from just reading the ZH manual, read the technical manual because uh, that's quite good. It's much more readable than kind of the data sheet is. And I've also put some links to uh, some other uh, YouTube videos on there, other people who've uh, built them. And also the, uh, the original author's website, a chap called Grant Searle, who goes into details about how this works. So if you're finding this interesting, uh, you know, when you finish watching my video, go and have a look at some of the links and uh, you'll get a much better explanation of how this works than you will from watching me. I said I wasn't going to talk this time, didn't I? Uh, I lied, didn't I? Right, okay, so what do we want? We need some IC sockets. So I'm wearing my little funky uh, bracelet again today. I can't believe uh, I ragged, uh, I, I was ragging Simon, wasn't I, in one of his videos uh, for wearing anti-static uh, wrist straps. Because uh, historically, I, I never bother. Um, I especially don't bother when I'm repairing some old bit of kit. Um, a lot of people take, I wouldn't say they take excessive anti-static preca precautions. If you're working in a production environment it's uh you know it, it, it's absolutely dead valid um i guess in many ways this is more the type of equipment that's probably more susceptible by esd because a lot of equipment that you buy these days you know they're very aware of the esd threat and uh, they suit will be pr protected uh, once you've got the ic's nailed down into a circuit board i've always found that you can handle them quite freely but maybe when you're just putting them in for the first time and the other thing is uh I tend to wear like a nylon fleece or stuff like that. You know, a lot of man-made synthetic fibres and you can just build up a ridiculous charge. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've bowed to, I'm not going to say popular demand, but I'm wearing an anti-static wrist strap today. And, uh, yeah, I guess you probably should. I need some water for my soldering iron. Give it a bit of a squirt. Squirty squirt. Oh, oh I've just wet everything. Oh, bugger. Oh, well. Right, okay. Oh, and I still haven't got my blue tack. I did steal some blue tack from work as well. I've left it in the car though. Damn. All right, let's get this one nailed in. Have I got it the right way around? Yeah. Yeah, so this big socket here, this is the uh, this is a 32K RAM, which is a 28 pin dip socket. I probably put this wrist strap on a little bit uh, prematurely, but uh, yeah, my wife mentioned something about that the other day. She has a habit of... Uh, yeah. Mm. I know a lot of people tend to use these helping hands and things when they solder but I've always found those helping hands to be unhelpful they always seem to you know they have them really rubbish crocodile clips on and, they, and you know the ones with um, you got like two crocodile clips on arms and they have a magnifying glass which just doesn't focus on anything or you know the magnifying glass is so badly assembled and on like a floppy um, almost like a rose joint it just kind of flops around and uh, yeah the crocodile clips are either really tight the little arms on it or they're dead loose and again they just flop around annoyingly so yeah i tend not to use those helping hands i've bought them in the past i've been suckered into it like everybody else does you know when you start in electronics you see these things and they're at the price point where you think oh i can afford that you know you go and buy your first uh was it akai soldier altai those are uh, yellow soldering irons that uh they sell at uh, maplins i mean again i used those soldier irons for years and then suddenly everybody came on and they said oh god you've got to use a temperature controlled iron if you don't use a temperature controlled iron all the uh, the pads will fall off your circuit board and uh, yeah amazingly enough i seem to get away using crap soldering irons for years i mean all my soldering irons were handed down from my granddad and they were you know, there were these terrifying things that had, like, kettle leads hanging off them, you know, that furry cable, and, uh, you know, kind of things like for soldering up car radiators. I mean, the, the actual bit that they would have had them probably died long, long ago, so, you know, every time the bit used to wear down a bit, you'd just take it out into the shed and file it down a bit more. And, uh, yeah, we didn't know any better, did we? And it seemed to work. And now we've all got these... Uh, fancy well this is a paste soldering iron i've got and uh yeah it's i'm gonna say it's good yeah it's a good soldering iron um i've got to admit if i was if i had really deep pockets i'd quite like to try one of those metcal irons 
but I get really confused about buying all the uh, consumables. I mean, I've just about figured out now after years of using Pace Irons what tip it is I use. I've got hundreds of tips here that don't fit anything, you know, conical and pointed and, I don't know, saber tooth tigers. I buy these tips and, uh, oh, the, you know, you have to buy a packet of them. You can't just buy one and you always buy the wrong one, or I do, because, uh, yeah. But I've got to admit, I think I've had this uh, soldering iron about, probably about five or six years and uh, I think it's on its second tip so if you do buy a quality soldering iron you know something that's designed for production um, the tips last longer but I've noticed how cheap it is to buy soldering irons now you I mean you see them on Amazon uh, and in fact I bought some cheap ones at work and I think they were about 20 pounds with a digital display and uh, yeah I mean they're not the quality of um, the Pace irons or a Metcal iron but for the hobbyists, they're absolutely, um, you know, they're brilliant. It's amazing how cheaply you can buy this stuff now. I was whinging yesterday about these horrible IC sockets. Well, that's what I'm going to use. And when I pull this apart, the fingers are going to slip off. And and what it, one of these IC sockets, it's going to turn round as I pull it off. And then one end of the sharp spikes are going to end up under my nail or something. Because that, that's just what happens to them. It just guarantees it. Right, is that going to go in there? Yeah, I, I don't know what you call these type of IC sockets. When I uh, when I steal them from work, I, uh, I I leave these sockets in the drawer, and I always go and get, I always steal the expensive ones, the uh, you know the ones that have got the turn pins, which are actually pretty expensive. But um, yeah, I don't I don't like these. I don't know what you call it. They've just kind of kind of got like little bent thin metal contacts in them. And I'm guessing that there really is nothing wrong with them. But um, if you're going to keep a piece of equipment for like many years, or it's something you're a bit proud of, you can spend a lot of time chasing your tail with problems caused by uh, crap sockets. It's not worth uh, spending that bit more. It's worth being a little bit more careful when you're stealing stuff from work, and just make sure you steal the good stuff and leave the rubbish for production. You know what, I nearly always sold in sockets uh, the wrong way around. You see, I've got, I'm going to have one of my pet gripes again. I mean, where did they actually choose to put the, uh, the ident layer? I mean, did they actually put it next to the chip where you would be able to see it? Or did they, in fact, put it under the chip where you can't see it? So, yeah, I'm, it's, it's just really easy, isn't it, just to stand back here. And I'm pointing out all the things I don't like with this PCB layout. Because I've done quite a lot of... PCB layout. It was one of my first jobs in, in electronics was uh, laying out PCBs and uh, uh, back in the day, you know, back in the day before you had auto routers and all this, like, it was effectively, it was almost just like 2D CAD. You literally just draw, drew tracks and you draw the pads and you didn't have all this schematic entry stuff, he said, not swearing. Uh, you know, you had to... Uh, just basically draw the tracks. It, it was little better than um, you know, using marker pen and tape to lay out your PCBs. You effectively just drew the tracks on the screen between the pads and you, you, know, you had to work it out for yourself. I think the first package I had was some DOS package and it was called Easy PC and it was very popular at the time and uh, yeah, um, I used to quite like doing that. You know, there's nothing, that, I mean, I, I love, I still love designing PCBs now. There's nothing quite as much fun as um as using uh you know just sitting there and and doing layouts it's kind of like a little bit of a crossword puzzle you know trying to use the minimum of uh links and crossovers and again that's the other thing that I, i'm not used to you know when i do have a go at um doing a pcb i look at this and it's full of uh you know vias and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with having a via is basically how you get from one side of the circuit board to the other because this will be a double sided board. Uh, but again, when I when I was growing up, um, most of the boards were single sided. Double sided was quite expensive. But if you as a designer, you would try to avoid using vias because the production process could be a bit dodgy. So if you wanted them to be good, you'd end up putting pins in and then soldering them through from one side to the others. But yeah, the production was always a bit dodgy in the early days for putting vias in, and it was always just a source of problems. So you, you try to avoid them, even if you're using a double-sided board. I forgot where I was going with that. Well, nowhere. Right, so we've got that in. Is that it for that board? That's it, isn't it?
So we could put the chips in. Oh no, we've got to put the uh, we've got to put the header strip in. Oh bugger! I haven't soldered that in very well. That's what you get when you're talking. Let's push that down and have another go. You know, I wish I had a tool for putting IC legs in. I'm sure. I, again, uh, I used to work at Tandy many years ago. One of my um, you know Saturday jobs when you leave uh, when you when you, you do it you know while you're still at school and uh, I worked at the Tandy in the Arndale Centre in uh, Manchester for. Well, I got to admit, not very long, because strangely enough, they fired me, which, uh, yeah, I seem to have been fired. And it wasn't for nicking stuff. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't uh, well, obviously I would have done if they'd given me the chance, but I, I didn't get around to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I used to like working at, at, at Tandy. I think basically it was probably for telling the customers that what they were selling was total crap and go and buy it somewhere else. There used to be some really good you know again back in the day um, your town would have some electronic shops probably pretty much going since the second world war you know all the army surplus days and uh, there was an area of manchester at the top of deansgate i think it was called shoed hill and there used to be a couple of these um uh, you know really i'm going to call them horrible old electronic shops you know really cheap low rent shops all the windows would be falling out and uh making a bugger of this you know all the windows would be falling out and you know all the components and posters were stuck to the wall by nicotine and uh you know the place was um probably frequented by radio hams that'd be stinking the place out uh, oh. Oh, God, i'm getting these horrible crunching noises when i put that in uh, but all them shops have gone haven't they uh, I'd love to know that anybody who's in the UK, if you still live in a town that's got you know an actual electronic shop uh, that sells you know your transistors and your capacitors and your bits of surplus gear, if you've still got one in your town, let me know. Um, I mean, even do you remember back in the day, Maplins used to sell electronic stuff as opposed to the useless crap farting dog toys that they sell now. You know, you could go into Maplins and you could buy any transistor and project boxes. I was in the Maplins the other day and, uh, you know, I looked at their project box uh, area and they've kind of got like two plastic boxes that are, you know, two little tiny things. Um, I think just recently they might have started to stock a little bit more because it's nice to see that the, uh, you know, the Arduino and the uh, Raspberry Pi um, that seems to have reawakened a lot of electronics in uh, in young people, um, and uh, yeah, that's got only got to be a good thing because uh, well, it's a great hobby, electronics. Oh yeah, we we're going to build the CPU board, weren't we? Um, so where is it? All right, I'm just reading this. There's some uh, links here that it says you can put in or not. I have to admit, I quite like the flexibility of installing links rather than soldering them across. So we'll put some of these links in. Um, I think there's a link for a weight link, a, a bus, requ bus request link, and a MMI. I think that's some kind of memory request mem MMI. Um, so we'll uh, we'll put those we'll put those links in. I've got my uh, camera set up at a bit of a, an odd angle because I've got it on the tripod again next to me. I could t probably do with doing it like a big Clive, having some kind of framework above me. But um, I've got a lot of uh, component drawers just in front of me, so it wouldn't be, uh, you know, particularly convenient to to rig that up. Because the main, uh, you know, the main purpose of my workshop is, you know, it's to build things, and it's not actually designed as a film studio. Um, it would obviously be nice to have it a bit more optimised for filming, but uh, yeah, I think you'll have to make do. If it's really bad, if the filming is really bad, and uh, you know you can't you find it a bit unwatchable um let me know and I'll, i will see if i can try and make it a bit better but if you don't shout up i probably won't bother uh, actually to be honest even if you do shout up i'm not pr promising anything but uh yeah if you don't know you've got a problem you can't deal with it it's kind of funny that the uh, like the cpus in many ways is the simplest board it's just got the cpu on it I think the most complicated board that we've got to build is the um, is the I/O board because that's got a you know it's got quite a lot of decoding chips on it and driver chips and loads of LEDs. Um, so yeah, the uh, 
Dutch I.O. board is probably the most complicated. And also the, um, I think the serial communication board, which has got a UART on it, and uh, also uh, a Max three two, a Max two three two, which is there to, um, you know, to level shift from TTL levels to uh, RS two three two um, levels. That's quite an interesting chip, that uh, Max two three two, in that it's got a little charge pump built into it. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if I'm going to use that or if I'm going to just use the FTDI header. I think I'm calming down a bit now. I'm getting a bit tired, but the other reason is uh, I've been in the car today driving around. I've been to uh, been up to Stratford upon Avon and been back to a been there and back to go to uh, a meeting to shuffle some bits of paper around. And uh, on the way back, I was sat in the car and uh, what was I doing? Oh, I was listening to that uh, very good. Um, kind of science technology program on podcast listening to the infinite monkey cage and also just stuffing myself with a huge bag of jelly babies so about you know halfway home i you know really wanted to puke because <laughs> i'd just eaten all these jelly babies so i think i've when i got into the uh, lab tonight into the workshop tonight i was on a bit of a, a sugar high you know zipping around with all the sugar and e numbers and things so i think i'm just starting to come down from that now Oh dear, getting a bit, uh, a bit thirsty. Probably all the uh, solder smoke could do with uh, some all whites lemonade because I'm a secret lemonade drinker. Or maybe watch out, watch out, there's a Humphrey about. None of the Americans will know what we're on about, will they? Man, you, nobody knows what I'm on about, I'm an idiot. So there's our Z80, what have we got left? We've got this, uh, I don't know, that EF6868B50P. I think that's our, I, I think I assume that's the part number, that's our UART anyway. I'm assuming this chip here that's got this label over it, that's going to be our ROM chip. And then again, we've got a little bit more of, a, a, you know, glue logic. I'm assuming we've got some more address decode in here. So let's put our Z80 in. And I think this is the first time I've ever really uh, held a Z80. I'm sure they've been in some bits of equipment that I've destroyed in the past without really paying any attention to it. On the top it says Zilog, Z80 CPU, and then it's got a part number under the Zilog which says Z8, Z84C001OPEG. So we've got to put that in and we've got to put it in the right way around, haven't we? We've got to try not to bend one of the pins under it, which is once you get these ICs of a certain size, you know, the more pins they have, the more harder it gets to line all the legs up. So you've got to kind of just work on, you know, kind of trying to pre bend them on one side a little bit. And you end up pressing a bit hard, and then one of the legs, rather than going into the socket, it'll just end up. You know, folding right under it, and uh, then I swear a lot and get really annoyed. And then you try and correct it. You try and straighten the pin using your fingers, and then the pin shoots up and goes right under your fingernail. And then you run around swearing a lot. Did I tell you the other day I was uh, having a chat on Twitter with uh, somebody? I quite like oh, bugger. I quite like Twitter, and uh, yeah, it's quite good to dip into. Uh, you know when you're doing other things and uh there's a, a a girl on there i forgot what her name is i think she's an american lady and uh, she was complaining about how painful it was standing on some lego brick and i just pointed out that uh you know she was kind of an amateur that came to pain i said if you really want pain there's nothing quite like uh standing on a 13 amp plug see that leg's bending there little buggers just bending are you going to go in are you going to bend under yeah, you've never if you've never stood on a thirteen amp plug, you you don't know pain. Looking at these legs on this IC, I mean I won't be able to show you on camera. Oh bugger now, I bent the one next to it. <laughs> oh dear. Oh no, I bent the other one on the other side. Oh. I think I might have been off camera then. I was just had a right pain trying to put this uh, this IC and this Z80 in this holder because all the pins were just bending everywhere and uh, 
yeah, these IC sockets are a bit rubbish. And I'm also just a bit bloody clumsy and cack handed. So if you stack all them things together, it's amazing I got it in it all. I think we're going to call it a night there. I was hoping we'd get onto the, uh, the ROM, but I bet I've been talking for 20, 30, 40 minutes. So I better shut up and go and have some dinner. But we've not got a great deal left to do. We've got the ROM board to build and we've got the uh, the Max 232. So hopefully we'll get them together in the very near future. And then it's uh, testing time. So that's something to look forward to, isn't it? But I think for now, that'll do. As always, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again very soon. Bye for now.